is in anthropology, but he has a joint appointment here at FBS, so it's really nice to have him give the presentation today. For those of you who don't know, Eduardo is originally from Argentina, and he came to the U.S. to do a Ph.D. at UC Davis in animal science, animal behavior at UC Davis. And uh, he, he finished at UC Davis, and then he started off a tenure-track position at Penn, following a number of postdocs at Harvard, at the Smithsonian, at the Zoological Society of San Diego. The dangers of putting a bio sheet on your iPad that you don't fully know how to use. Um, so he had these postdocs at Smithsonian, at Harvard, at the Zoological Society of San Diego, and then he joined the, uh, the faculty at, at Penn in anthropology. And he was there until 2014 when, when Yale scooped him. That's about the best way to put it. Um, Yale scooped him in the Department of Anthropology and here at FBS. And if you look at his website, if you look at his publications, they really span a number of different realms. I'm just going to highlight a, a four that I think have particular links to uh, those of us here at FBS. One, he's developed a program that looks at the evolution and biological basis of hair bonds, uh, which is a likely fundamental adaptation of early hominins. He's also looked at the relationship among mating systems, competition, and sexual dimorphism. Um, and one thing that we were just talking about is he's also looked at the evolution of diurnality, nocturnality, and sleep, and how things like lighting might affect sleep and activity patterns. In 1996, he started the Owl Monkey Project of Argentina, and 16 years ago, he established, together with Professor Di Fiore from UT Austin, the Monogamous Primates Project in the Amazon rainforest of Yasuni National Park in Ecuador. If you look at the list of students, postdocs, emerging researchers that Eduardo has mentored and advised through the years. I mean, the, the number is really long, but also I think very importantly, it's very clear that he's been an exceptional mentor to uh, young uh, scholars who've gone on to have very successful careers. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Eduardo Fernandez Duque. Thank you, Karen. Thank you all for, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, I'm very, very pleased. Uh, I really spent quite some time reflecting and thinking about what we've done over the last 20 years. And it was, it was a wonderful opportunity that the talk has given me to reflect on that. Uh, what I want to do, first of all, I mean, you, you, what you'll feel is that we're going to cover a lot of ground. And we may not go in depth into some topics. But that's because I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying at Yale. So I'm really hoping, one of the reasons, one of the things that I'm hoping from the, from the presentation is that I'll follow up with some of you, whether you would like me to go and give a lecture in your course, whether you're a student and you're looking for opportunities, anything. Please follow up because what we need is more people joining our efforts. And because we share the home institution, what I want to do first, before anything else, is share with you something that I've been doing together with my wife and colleague in every single course we teach. The first five minutes we meditate. And so I want to invite you to shut down those cell phones, to put down your cups for just a few minutes and join me. You've made it this far. So you might as well fully commit to the next 45 minutes and get something out of it. I mean, if you came here, it's because you decided you wanted to leave whatever seemed on the desk behind. So let me help you do that. So three, four minutes, this is what we do every single class of the semester. Students need to show up at nine, if they want to join us at 9.05, if they don't. So follow me. Close your eyes. Everyone has closed their eyes, so don't feel threatened because nobody's looking at you with your eyes closed. And just take a deep breath, the first one. Ignore the thoughts that are coming in saying, why on earth are we doing this? Just focus on your breathing. Notice your feet, I suggest you put them on the ground. Are they cool, are they warm? We're just trying to be here for a few minutes. 
Notice your hands. You might want to have them resting on your lap or hanging on the side. But this is your time. You decided to come here. Let's get the most out of it. Take another deep breath. Air in. Hold it for a couple seconds. And let go. One more time. Deep breath. Hold it and let go. And I know, I know that you're already noticing, isn't this amazing? It's taking me two minutes and I'm starting to relax. Only think about your breathing, it'll always be there. I will give you silence. You just go through two or three more of these deep breaths so that you can fully, fully commit to the next 40 minutes we'll spend together. When you're done, just open your eyes and let me know that you're ready for the presentation. Thank you. Students love it. It's a way in which we can help them. So you're putting all this effort into preparing your lectures, and unless you help them be there, you're wasting your time, they're wasting their time. So invite them. It may be this, it may be something else, but invite them to really explicit, be explicit about saying, join me for these 50 minutes because you've already made it this far. Get something out of it. So enough preaching. Let's go. But it connects to the first slides. Yes, I will be talking about the behavior ecology and conservation of mammals in the Chaco. But I'm also showing you, before anything else, my three boys. And it'll make sense at the end. And why? Because even when all of us, most likely we're here because to some extent we believe in what science can teach us, we cannot have the science detached from emotions, from how we feel. They really need to go together. And, and I'm hoping that through the talk, I'll be able to convey some of that as we look at the data as well. So I, there are two sites where I've been working for some time. One is in Yasuní National Park in Ecuador. The other one is in the South American Chaco, the, the Argentinian Chaco. And for today, we're going to focus primarily on the Argentinian Chaco. And what we've done together with Tony Di Fiore, my, my dearest friend and colleague, is we put together a system of four different taxa that we can study in different ecologies, in the, in the Amazon of Ecuador, in the Chaco of Argentina, and I also do some research with captive colonies in the US, giving us multiple approaches to understanding aspects of their behavior. But like I said, I'm sorry, and that program, this is my kind of intellectual background. These are central questions to understanding what makes us human, yeah? So, so we're always in anthropology and evolution of biology, we're trying to understand why we're organized in certain types of societies, very, very frequently with the existence of pair bonds, this kind of very stable, enduring relationship between two individuals. In some societies, we'll see that the male partner will engage heavily in taking care of the young. And as we do that, we notice differences, we notice similarities between the sexes and between the gender. And so these are some of the central questions that I've been tackling over the years, and some of which I will try to describe to you how we approach them by looking at non-human primates. So much easier, I may regret saying that. In some aspects, easier than working with humans. So, but for today, let's travel to the South American Chaco, an area about the size of Texas and Arizona combined. But within the Chaco, I really work on a tiny, tiny piece of that. You can see the red square there showing you Estancia Huaycolec, 25,000 hectares, and that's where most of my research takes place. We'll come back to this, but notice the rivers in dark dark green, yeah, system of rivers draining in the Paraguay River. How do I get to put together the presentation that I'm gonna share with you? I was a student in 1995, Tim Carroll was one of my professors, and at that time we were just beginning to talk about the importance of combining behavioral ecology, which was really what his wife, Monique Borges-Mulder, was doing with humans, and conservation biology. 
and he edited this, which must have been one of the first attempts at bringing together the two disciplines, behavioral ecology and conservation biology. So that, the book came out in 98, but we were reading his draft and working on it as I was finishing my PhD. And I knew, going back to Argentina from UC Davis, that I wanted to do a little bit of both. I wanted to have some behavior component to my research program, but I also wanted to do some conservation biology. And we, we'll talk first about what we've done on behavioral ecology, then we'll move at, at how that influenced our research on conservation biology. To the young people in the audience, all these things really start small, as you're starting now. I mean, my very first grant was from the Leakey Foundation. We went down there in 1996 with $4,000, and that's how it all started. We just wanted to understand something about the diurnality, the nocturnality of owl monkeys. So in 96, I started the Owl Monkey Project. Uh, we're very proud to say that it's one of the longest projects on any primate and I want to say about maybe one of 50, maybe 100 projects of any mammal in the world that has lasted this long. We're proud of saying that we have a year-round operation down there, so there's always people. That has translated pretty much into, into not having the light, into roughly four hours a day, every single day for 24 years straight. So we have relatively large sample sizes for collecting demographic data. We monitor roughly 25 groups. And we have, uh, we have electricity and light makes you need glasses. And there we go. Thank you. And we do behavior on approximately 10 groups. Within the ranch, we have set aside an area where we do most of the research. It's about 100 hectares. You see there the, the system of trails that we have cut north, south, and east, west. And we have a little camp. You'll see some pictures about it later. And we also have a field station in the city of Formosa where we can provide some lodging to students, where we have a library, and we can, I can, if you can visit, I guarantee you we'll have some good Argentinian meat to share over a social event. So both the, the field station in the city of Formosa and the ranch, which is only 25 kilometers on a national paved road from the city, so very convenient. These are the people who are making all this possible these days. Marcelo has been working with me since 1999, and he's permanently based in Argentina. Alba is a PhD student from Universidad de Barcelona, who's also now permanently living in Formosa. And Emily, who is a second year PhD student in the combined forestry anthropology program. Like Karen was saying, we've been very lucky to have big numbers of students and assistants going through the project. I mean, most of what I'm going to share with you could not have been done without the help of so many people who've come through the project through all these years. Owl monkeys, what was it that we wanted to study? They span from Panama down to Argentina. But in most of that continental distribution, if you're going to go study owl monkeys, this is pretty much all you'll see. They are the only genus of primates with nocturnal habits in the neotropics. And they're exclusively nocturnal from Panama down to somewhere in Bolivia. So my first question, that's why I studied, studied nocturnalis, was can we do that in Argentina? Because people had reported that the species that ranges in southern Bolivia, Paraguay, and Argentina have also some diurnal habits. So we needed to quantify that and figure out if it was possible to study the things that we were interested in with some light. And yes, we confirmed that there was enough activity day and night to develop our plans, so we did. I'm not gonna really talk much about diurnality or nocturnality. If you're interested in that and the evolution of sleep, Please follow up, we can get together for lunch, or if there's opportunity for another talk, because it is a whole, uh, whole other presentation. What I wanna do is focus a little bit more on aspects of sexual dimorphism, the evolution of pair bonding and monogamy, and the evolution of fatherhood and paternal care. Sexual dimorphism, this is what they look to us. I mean, those are posters that I keep because they are from the first field course we taught back in 2002, and that's how what we use for the toilets. We cannot tell a male from a female. If you think about it, I mean, think about the mammals you know, and that's rather unusual. For most mammals, you can tell 
males from females, if for no other reasons, because you can spot the penis and the testes of the male. Very, very difficult to tell the males from the females. We needed to quantify, describe that some more. So over the years, we've been capturing them. And this is just a very simple graph showing you that the body mass of males and females is remarkably similar. And everything we've looked at, except for aspects of olfactory communication, we cannot find differences that us as humans can tell between the males and the females. So we needed to mark them, because how on earth are you going to study pair bonding? How on earth are you going to study the behavior of animals looking at fatherhood and paternal care if you cannot tell the male from the female? So we've been doing that for a long time. We capture the animals. We do physical exams. We feed them with radio colors that allowed us to find them easily and monitor large number of groups and, and be able to collect data when we need it. That has allowed us, among other things, like I was saying before, to, for example, describe the ranges of 18 social groups. The graph is showing you the fact that owl monkeys organize their use of space in a somewhat territorial manner. Each group occupies an area that doesn't overlap entirely with the areas occupied by other groups. So these are 18 groups. And if you take any of those, you're going to see an inner kernel that shows the 50% probability of use of that space. And then the other one, which I always get confused because we've done 80 and 90, is one of the other two that I'm depicting in that graph. The average size, roughly six hectares for each group. When you talk to my colleagues studying capuchins or studying chimps, et cetera, they can believe that I can have close to 15 groups in one square kilometer. So it is a very convenient system to do demographic work. In one morning with telemetry, I can walk through the forest and get the group composition of 10 groups. Territoriality, that's going to be important. Make a note of it. We confirmed, although people have suggested this, that every single group we found only had one reproducing male and one reproducing female. At the time, we didn't know if they were pair bonded. A bond is more than just being close to each other, or I would be arguing that you're bonded to the driver of the bus that you take every, every single morning coming to work. A bond is more than proximity. And over the years, we've shown that animals are bonded. For this slide, what I want you to get is that there's just one male and one female sharing that territory, and they live there together with some young. And I'm not saying they're offspring. We'll follow up on that. For now, I'm saying that I go there, I see one male, one female, and between two and four individuals that look smaller, and I assume are younger. Paternal care. Even more fascinating than the monogamy aspect of owl monkeys is there's something that really makes them rather you, pretty much unique. I mean, it's them and it's the titty monkeys of the Amazon basin is that the male, besides nursing, he does it all. After the fir first few days of life, the infant transfers to the dad, to the male, and the male plays with the infant, shares food, transports the infant, goes to the rescue of the infant, much more than the mother does. Again, think about the mammals you know. That's very unusual, right? And here, and we, we, many of us are familiar with farms, so we can think about farm animals. You don't see the male engaged with the young. Extreme, extreme forms of paternal care in the owl monkeys. And this has been a puzzle in evolutionary biology. Monogamy remains a puzzle. Paternal care remains a puzzle. And it comes down to basic aspects of mammalian biology. Uh, the puzzle is, why do you see monogamy at all in mammals, where you have that females are the ones committed to a period of pregnancy and lactation? So the females after conception, if you're talking humans, are really stuck with that investment at least for nine months. For those of us guys, there isn't much we need to do or we can do. After conception, a female can raise the offspring by herself. Why is it that males commit to a monogamous relationship when in so many other attacks that what you see is that males put that effort into reproducing with many, many females? So monogamy is rare among mammals, much more common in birds. But in birds, you have a completely different system of reproduction, right? In birds, you don't have pregnancy. You don't have lactation. So the contributions of males and females to the young can be much more even than they are in mammals. 
So the, you, you can find lots of literature about the evolution of monogamy and paternal care in mammals. And one of the hypotheses that people have explored says that the reason that you find monogamy is because sometimes the males, given how females are distributed in space, and that's why it's important you remember the slides I, sh I just showed you, males cannot really monitor more than one female at a time. So if that were true, you, you could make some predictions derived from that hypothesis about ranging, about territory size, about how many males for unit of space you would find. So let's go back to the data we have on ranging. There you have two groups that I'm just illustrating, uh, choosing for, for illustration. Those two groups occupy areas that are roughly five hectares in size. And they have one male and one female, like all, the, all groups do. But they are in green. Now you have groups also with one male and one female, which are now occupying close to 10 hectares each. So clearly, if those males in the green circles can monitor the females over 10 hectares, they could probably also be doing something like this hypothetical group Red is doing now. You, could, you should see males becoming polygynous. I mean, those same males that are ranging over 10 hectares in the green circles could be ranging over the two smaller red territories that I showed you before. But you don't see that. So the question becomes, why is it that we're not seeing a polygynous male phenotype invading the population if clearly, given the data we have on ranging, the males can range over the area of more than one female. Are you following me? The answer to that comes from something that we learned almost five or six years into the project and which has been one of the central contributions of the project, realizing that the population of our monkeys, at least in Formosa, it's not only formed by social monogamous groups of one male, one female, and some young, but there are as many as 25% of adults who are ranging alone. We call them floaters. They are solitaries. And these animals who are very strong, relatively healthy young adults have just left their groups. They've dispersed from home. And now guess what? They're trying to find a reproductive opportunity. They are trying to find a place where they can settle down. Now, our area is full of territories and groups. So the only way in which they can settle down is by kicking out a same-sex pair-bonded animal from one of the resident groups. And so over the course of 10 years, we noticed that on 27 occasions, the female in the group was kicked out, was replaced by a female floater. And on 23 times, we saw that for males. So males and females, think about the sexual dimorphism. Think, think about the size. This is happening for both sexes. Males and females are competing with other males and females for entering that group. This is vicious. This is aggressive. This can be lethal. But, and it's changing the dynamics of that pair bond between the resident pairs. Now, in, that, in this first analysis we did through 2010, we found that the median duration of pair was roughly nine years. And it, this has consequences for the reproductive success of those pairs. In the graph I'm showing you, the number of infants produced by individuals which only had one partner during their lifetime and individuals who were forced to have more than one partner. And you can see that there is a drop. There's a 25% decrease in the reproductive success of adults who are forced to change partners. So now we have both evidence of competition and we have evidence suggesting that there is a decrease in fitness when the time that you spend with your partner is shortened through that competition. Now, so we can go back to that hypothesis and really rephrase it or make it more, more nuanced and say that yes, maybe the distribution of females is important, but what seems to be regulating the extent to which animals can or cannot be monogamous is mate guarding. The ability of the opposite sex individual to keep competitors at bay. What you should see in this situation is that if I'm a male, a pair bonded male, I should be very aggressive and trying to keep those male floaters at bay from my group. 
Now, with the way in which we can check whether that May garden is working, working in, in an evolutionary sense, working in the sense that it's really preventing those floaters to moving in or, or actually reproducing with a female is by doing genetics. And so remember all those captures we did in the past. So after some 10 years, we went back to all the genetic samples and for, I think it was 35 infants for which we had high quality DNA, 35 infants born to 17 pairs, we assessed paternity. Because here the central question was, are those males that we have observed behavioral data putting so much energy into the young, really the biological fathers of those young? If May Garden, if I'm gonna argue that May Garden is working, I should find that those males are really being successful in keeping intruders at bay, reproducing faithfully with a partner, and then committing resources to raising the young that they have sired. And yes, they do. I mean, for all 35 infants that we checked, we found no evidence of extra pair paternity. For primates, it's a very decent sample size. You'll hear some more about this in a few minutes. We'd like to expand it, we'd like to replicate it because it's, not, it's only 35 infants from 17 pairs. But this is the only non-human primate for which we have data that in a socially monogamous system, there is no extra, extra pair paternity. So not only are they socially monogamous, but they are genetically monogamous. So with that, we will stop. I mean, we can talk so much more, and I hope we will. But I do want to spend some time also telling you how all of this, remember, I mean, how many of you knew about Tim Carroll's book? How many of you checked that literature? Just give me some hands. Not a lot, okay. But uh, this is the common history of so many of us who went to the field with the idea to study behavior. And the moment we started doing that, and the moment we started real, and I go to the emotions and the feelings and, and the interactions as humans, the moment we started interacting with, with the community where the monkeys lived, and I mean the human community, you really very quickly, even more since I was working in my own country, you become very emotionally connected to issues of conservation of the environment. And so what I want to show you now is everything we've been able to do through a single taxon approach. So I want to be very clear about that. I'd be lying if I said that I went down there in 96 thinking that we would be doing all this. I found myself looking back, I said, oh, wow, we got that and we got this. It's, it took me like 10, 15 years to really bring it forward, to really make it a central point of my research agenda to work on environmental issues, on conservation biology issues. But we know, and there's some interesting literature that I can share with those of you who, who want to see it, we know that long-term projects like ours have had huge impacts on the conservation of the species, but also the habitats where the projects occur. The first one was that because of all that, we started Fundacion Eco with my wife in 1999, and the mission was education. That, that's really the, the single word that summarizes everything we're trying to do through Fundacion Eco of Formosa. Um, but and these are just examples of the kind of education that we did and how it made people realize, know about owl monkeys. Owl monkeys being somewhat nocturnal, cryptic, small, I mean, they're completely out, out of the picture for, for Argentina mammal uh, knowledge. So these days, you can find them in, in books depicting, I mean, you, you find a book of, of babies of mammals in Argentina and the owl monkeys are there. Uh, the local newspapers acknowledging the work we've been doing for some 20 years. I have some posters there. This coming March, we're having the first meeting of a national plan for the protection of primates in Argentina. Owl monkeys are up there, they're visible, and everyone knows about them. This is the poster that I was mentioning before. Very, very important consequence that the province of Formosa, owl monkeys are only found in two provinces in Argentina, Formosa and Chaco. And they've been given the highest level of protection. They call them provincial monuments. So through our work, through making owl monkeys known to people, it, we've, we've contributed to giving them the highest level of protection they can get for any animal species in the province. Another wonderful, wonderful consequence of the work 
is that we build relationships with the ranch owners, they know us, and so 10 years into the project, they agreed to set aside, I sometimes you'll hear me say 1,500, other times 2,000, we don't know because there's no fence, but there's really a good chunk of forest where they have stopped doing absolutely everything. So there's no cattle, there's no selective logging. So that's been great. And uh, for me, the most substantial evidence of that is that it belongs in their maps. It's not just me saying there's the reserve, but when you get their internal documents and you look at their zoning of the 25,000 hectares, you see the reserve on their own uh, documents. So that's been big, big and wonderful news. Something else that links behavior and conservation biology, I did not know, I was browsing today, I, I found this today, this page at one of the Yale servers. And what we did, which was very important, we have a major, major problem with some of the owl monkey species in Colombia. Issues of smuggling, issues of animals being harvested for biomedical research. This has gone all the, all the way up to the Supreme Court. But what we were able to do, we are the only project that has information on behavior and life history of wild owl monkeys. And so it was fascinating to go to a workshop that they hosted and ask telling them, listen, you really have to adjust your parameters for modeling how many owl monkeys can be harvested because you're using parameters developed from captive populations. And animals in captivity, they're well fed, they're healthy, they're taken care of. I mean, you breed them, right? These are breeding colonies. So of course they're producing babies like crazy. Not me. Of course they're producing babies like crazy. So they were, they were, they were modeling the viability of the population and they're completely wrong scenarios given what we know from wild owl monkeys. So that has been a very, very direct contribution from studies of behavior and life history to very applied decisions that had to do how many owl monkeys will the Colombian government authorize to harvest for biomedical reasons. Also a consequence of the research with the owl monkeys is that following a postdoctoral position that Dr. Marin Hook had with the project, she really got interested in trying to understand the predators of the owl monkeys, which took us to understanding the mammal community in White Collect Ranch. And so for many years, we are now on a, we're kind of redeciding what to do, but for like, starting 2010, we went to, through 2016, we had some camera trap monitoring that had never been done in the area. I mean, uh, we are all very familiar with this technique. Oh, there's nothing novel about it. The only thing novel was that nobody had surveyed properly the diversity of mammals in the area. And there were some cool surprises waiting for us. I, I mean, we all know camera traps, but it's like you cannot stop wondering at the stuff that one day, you, I mean, you just down, download files and there you go, right? Here you have the Geoffrey's cat with a big rodent in his mouth. This was a fun uh, story. Many years ago, before we studied the camera traps, somebody had told us that they found this skull. And somebody was saying, well, well this, is, this is a caveat. This is a species that have never been described for Formosa. You really have to report this. Really. And we say, well, I mean, but how do I know how the skull got here, right? I mean, so it was just one skull, and there's so many ways in which the skull can get to where we found it. But then, then the Aguri showed up in one of the cameras. And right after mom shows up, mom and the baby showed up in the same place where we had, kind of the same area where we had found the skull. So this study allowed us to document for the first time this mammal in the whole of, of Formosa province. We've done a lot of work on forest ecology. I don't know how many forest ecologists we have here, but it took me a long time to realize that nothing makes sense unless we understand the food base. And uh, I remember when I was in grad school, I, I was not excited about looking at trees. But these days, uh, I know that unless we understand what's the food out there, nothing makes sense. So we've done a lot of work on forest ecology. We have 30 plots that uh, we monitor every month, and we've surveyed every 10 years. And now, th those are plots, 30 plots that we have in the gallery forests. But now Emily, the PhD student in the combined program that I mentioned to you, she's uh, looking at also some of the data from some plots we have in fragments. I should have mentioned this before. 
I want you to be aware, this is not human induced. This is a naturally fragmented landscape. It's a fascinating system for so many questions related to, to uh, evolution biology, environmental studies. So uh, this is the area where we have done most of the work, but then you have all these patches that are isolated by matrix of savanna and wetlands. And it's been like that ever since. That has nothing to do with logging. So Emily has been looking at some of the data from all plots. These are data, this is just to give you a little bit of a sense of the data sets we have. Uh, not for much to discuss now, but if you're interested in. So here she's been summarizing the data for 98, 2008, and 2018. For example, pointing that some taxa seem to have doubled in density in those 30 plots. Other taxa, I'm sorry, these two have, have actually be reduced by 50% their density. Gymnantis, for example, has increased in density. I mean, this is work in progress, but finally, through Emily's eyes, we're putting our hands on this data on forest composition and phenology that we've been collecting over 30, over 20 years. So that's a little bit of the things that we've been doing. I definitely wanted to have some time left for what's coming because that's really where we all get excited and where we need more hands, more brains, and more help. One of the things that's actually it's been happening, it's not that we haven't started, but, but it's slow, slow work. We, we, we've been trying to kind of export to use all the know-how that we've developed in the ranch to the system of ranches that, so remember how I told you that what we have here are corridors, natural corridors. You can see all the small rivers in red draining to the Paraguay River. And in 2010, the province of Formosa passed a law where they did a completely rezoning of the whole province. And if the rivers are in red, is because those are areas that you cannot really touch, at least on paper, we don't need to go into that. Uh, so very, very important, very interesting to see what's the situation of all these natural corridors. And what we're hoping to do in collaboration with Cecilia Juarez, did I forget? Oh, should I forgot? I had it. I typed her name and <laughs> I forgot to paste. Cecilia did her PhD in the project <coughs> and then she got a position at the local university, the local National University of Formosa, where she studied the Centro de Biodiversidad del Chaco Argentino. So working in collaboration with her, we're developing a network of monitoring location, monitoring ranches, spanning many of the river systems, where we're hoping to use what we've learned from White Collect, very, very intense data collection to a bigger scale where we're hoping or she's hoping she'll be able to work with the ranch owners to implement some measures that can help them protect a little bit of a, mainly the gallery forest. That's where we've been working the most. Little things that we've been doing along those lines, Cecilia only started the center two years ago. These are just some data as you drive all around the province, they started collecting information on the number of animals road kills. And it's quite impressive, something that's happened in Formosa in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of development of paved roads, and of course that makes people drive more, and, and well, you know where I'm going with the story. This is a study they did between May and September 2017, every month. They would go and survey uh, two circuits that cover pretty much the eastern portion of Formosa province. They cover roughly 7,000 kilometers, and you can see the numbers of animals that they collected on the national paved highways or the provincial ones. Uh, some foxes, raccoons, but also sometimes very, very sad. I, I run into these guys all the time, Maine wolves uh, and river otters. Those are not in big numbers, so I'm sure we have a problem when so many of them are dying on the roads. Something else that we are also studying, I mean, she's just got a National Geographic grant. Alba, I mentioned her before, she's a PhD student looking at how vocal communication may be helping regulate pair bond relationships and that competition between the floaters and the pairs. So uh, to do that, Alba is getting her feet wet. Uh, oh, there's a picture coming showing somebody with the feet wet. Maybe that, that played out in my brain as I said that. Uh, so Alba is setting up. We were just getting started trying to use the passive acoustic monitors 
Uh, so we, uh, coming this March, we're going to do the first preliminary studies monitoring the vocal, vocal communication of our monkeys. If any of you has any reason, I mean, we know how these things go, we are not going to be able to have man or woman power to handle the tons of data that are going to come in. And it's always a good idea to tell my students, don't go to people saying, I have this data. No. Find those people at the stage when you're designing the study. So there's still time. If you have a reason why you may be interested in being part of this effort, we already have the monitors. We're going to be setting them up. But if for any reason you'd like to hear more about it because you think that there are some aspects of those data that could be of interest to you, this is the time to let me know. Bigger, bigger scope projects. We're taking students all the time, and we've been doing it for 20 years. Uh, since I came to Yale, Yale students are going. I'd like to expand that. I think that we, we can continue working on providing more and more opportunities to our young students to experience this. This is just an example. Claire, she's an environmental studies major. She spent last summer there trying to understand the relationship between group size foraging and ranging in howlers. So she spends eight weeks. I think she was supported by the environmental studies major, and she focused on two groups of howlers, and she followed them all day long, collecting some feeding data, some ranging data, learning how to map those data, learning how to analyze those data, and then trying to understand if she could spot some differences in their feeding habits, given the very, very different sizes of the two groups. They, for the good news, we're keeping our fingers crossed, but what Gisela Cacone, eh, it looks like we're going to be getting a three-year grant that will allow us to really expand and do all kinds of genetic analysis for the samples that we've collected since 2010, not only to replicate those analyses of paternity, but also to get at things that will tell us a little bit more what kind of movement we may have of our monkeys along those corridors, for example. And the very last one that I want to show you, this is the major goal. Uh, who knows how it's going to go. But we know, we know that there's interest from the ranch in sitting down and they, they would be willing to have a serious conversation for selling part of the ranch to make it a, a reserve. Like I told you, today we have a reserve, but it belongs to the ranch. And this is a big company. They own like 10 or 15 ranches in the country. So who knows uh, how that could go the day that some, something changes within the company. So uh, if you want the data from the monitoring, get in touch with me. If you have the money to purchase the land, get in touch with me. Uh, or if you have ideas or if you want to work towards any of those goals. Very last slide. We're going to go back to the very first one. It's been 20 years. And my, I mean, I, I get so much from seeing our young colleagues spend time in the field. I mean, this is the setting where I'm not telling you anything we don't know. But it's been fantastic this past January. And yes, this is personal, but all, everything we do has a personal component. So I showed you my two young when they were in the forest. They grew up in the forest. This past January, I was working here in New Haven. I, I, I had Facundo spending time in Tiputini, Ecuador. He was a research assistant for the, one of the mannequin projects down there. At the same time, I had Matias in the site in Formosa. And I still get chills when I think about that. But I like to think that one of the reasons that you can get this is because we start exposing them to, to the beauty, to the beauty of nature early on. I, I really feel and I'm convinced that the experiences they had early on made this so much more possible. And I hope you'll join me in trying to continue working in generating more and more opportunities for every student at Yale to go see the outdoors, to travel international, to go experience eight weeks of owl monkeys, tapers, and everything you can imagine. Thank you so much. Florencia. Yeah, I wonder how these uh, monkeys have evolved uh, with regards to their predators. If they are nocturnal, most of their predators are nocturnal, although maybe the big cats are gone from the Chaco at this point. Uh, but most likely the, the big snakes are some of their predators, uh, maybe owls, uh, they <coughs> may predate on the young. So how do they defend themselves against their predators? Are they like real quick or 
are they very, their meat is very distasteful for the predator, something like that, or they're too furry to be really eaten. Uh, somehow, because it's very strange that a small mammal it has evolved to be nocturnal, and most of the predators are nocturnal in the forest. Well, mammals, the, the, the consensus is that early mammals were nocturnal to begin with. So, so you have to think that the, 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 we have, I mean, my colleague, uh, Eric Sargis, has been studying tree shrews, which are, I mean, uh, uh, we, when we look at tree shrews, we try to imagine what a, an early primate may have looked like. So we do have early mammals being nocturnal. Now, the, the, the issue, the hypothesis of nocturnality and predation has come up, because remember, what we don't know yet is why of the 60 genera of primates in the neurotropics, only one became secondarily nocturnal. So now I'm quoting my colleagues who do paleo work. The consensus seems to be that the early primates in the Americas were diurnal. Every other primate but all monkeys in the Americas is diurnal. These guys now, eventually, some 20 million years ago, we have fossil evidence from La Venta in Colombia showing that now they have big eyes, they must have evolved nocturnal. What happens here, now, now they go back to exploring the day. People have said, well, that's going to have to do with changes in the pre predator community. It is possible, but it's so, so difficult to assess. So we do not have big eagles. We do not have kind of the monkey hunting, e hunting eagles in Formosa that you have in the Amazon. The, yes, we have cats, but I cannot imagine a cat will make, will target our monkeys. The, mo the, the candidate we have, because we've collected direct evidence, are the tyras, Eira Barora, uh, Mustelera. So we have seen tyras interacting viciously with our monkeys. Uh, now, we do not have yet any direct, direct evidence of predation on owl monkeys. We've seen them interacting with the taras, we've seen them interacting with some large uh, hawk, but never to the point where monkeys dead. Uh, snakes, no, we uh, remember that in the chapel, we, we don't have arboreal snakes. So that, again, that's another big difference. And, and even the anacondas that we have, uh, the common name is escaping me, but they're not a risk to the owl monkeys. So we think that the, this, the, the suspects are, is mainly the tyra, but we have no direct evidence of them. That's what I, uh, Maren wanted to do, to really study uh, the interactions between some of the potential predators and the owl monkeys, and, and it's a work in progress. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about the creation of the preserve on the ranch and what you attribute the success to? Uh, it really comes down to getting along with the CO. And that's sometimes, uh, I don't know if we should think of it as, as not very, I mean, I, I struggle with this because I don't think it was created because of any aspect of our research or our publications or the quality of our data. I mean, the CEO was a person. Uh, so the, the story, when I went there in 96, the ranch was owned by a company that had held the ranch for 75 years, when it was 225,000 hectares. These were the big, humongous ranches in Argentina that some, I mean, some, some of them owned by British companies who would come and pull out the hardwoods for building the railroads. So they went from 225,000 hectares to 25 when I started in 96. In 2003, they, they sold the company to another big company. And the CEO of this new company completely changed the way that the ranch was run. For one thing, before then, it was open gate. I could tell people, hey, let's go have a barbecue. You just drive into the ranch, and the same way that I would do it, poachers would do it. 2003, they closed the gate, insurance for everyone, things changed. And the guy was very, very strict, very firm, but he said, listen, well, this is the way we work, but there will be benefits. I mean, let's do it, but we'll have to get our MOUs, we'll have to get things. And eventually he said, well, can, can, we, can we start talking about this? And I remember 2006 was the 10th anniversary of the, of the project. So I invited him and I invited the National Director of Wildlife from Buenos Aires to come, so we, we pulled some resources, we had a big gathering, we hosted a wonderful, wonderful lunch, 
uh, in the ranch, and he was very proud to be sharing with the authorities that they had decided to set aside this 1,500, 2,000 hectares. Now, I share it with you this way, and it sounds like a wonderful story. My fear is that I can wake up tomorrow. In fact, I, I didn't know how to share this. I mean, the ranch was owned until 72 hours ago by a 93-year-old lady. And she was the owner until 72, years, 72 hours ago, you, you reached the conclusion. Now the ranch is owned by her two daughters. And this is the kind of thing that I have no idea how things are going to develop. That's why we're working with Fundación Vía Silvestre and Aves Argentinas. We've been talking about this, but we've been talking about this for many years uh, because we know that there's a lot of interest from the community, the, the conservation biology community in Argentina. This is a top, top priority for protection. This is an area that deserves national park consideration. Uh, but you're also talking that it is $20 million if you wanted to get the whole ranch. Uh, now, is that a lot of money or not? It depends who we run into. Well, yeah, yeah, we know how it is. So it's a big dream, but, but we keep working towards it. Did I see a hand there? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think what you described was the owl monkeys that you studied at a very southern part of the species range and in a fragmented habitat. Um, how do how does their behavior or their ecology differ as you go north into larger blocks of forest? And what does that say about the significance of the work here as opposed to elsewhere? Or how does that inform us? Uh, it informs us more than if we were looking at another genus. <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's complicated because from Panama down to Argentina. Nobody has ever reported all monkeys that are not found in small groups that suggest a kind of pair living monogamous social structure, something basic. No one has ever reported the use of space that doesn't suggest a relatively small home range. Where things get more complicated are, is with the things that, I mean, I, I told you that it was a positive aspect, me sharing with the people studying Aeotus vociferans and Nancy Ma in Colombia say, listen, your life history parameters are off. But in that case, I didn't mind. The truth is that owl monkeys, a fascinating difference is that the owl monkeys at the, at the southern extreme of the distribution are 50% larger. We have a paper published where we show Allen's rule, embarrassment rule for the owl monkeys. They're 50% larger than the tropical ones. So. Maybe that's one of the reasons that things are slower. Uh, so things that we have used a lot for helping, we have, we have colleagues with whom we're trying to collaborate in Colombia, in Peru, Bolivia, uh, detect, I mean, basic, basic knowledge for assessing densities and presence and absence, all those things we have really shared and uh, they've been very, very useful. I mean, we are so successful using playbacks. I mean, I can go to a patch, do a playback and tell you if we have our monkeys or not. I mean, we do the playback, they answer, we move on. So uh, things that have to do with assessing presence, absence, estimating densities, abundance, that a lot of our work can be translated to any other areas. The problem is that studying them, we tried studying them in Tibutini, in the Odos vociferan. We fitted one animal with a radio collar. Now, the only thing that I was able to do is listen to the beep in the dark. So, <laughs> because it's so hard to study them uh, in the dark. Uh, the, I have one colleague who's studying them in El Valle de, la, de Magdalena, in Colombia, and he tells me that the force is not very high. He tells me that, that the, the animals range not more than four or five meters high, and he really gets to see them well. Uh, so uh, I, I would be very careful in, in translating too much about the specifics of behavior from a species that has colonized a much harsher habitat. We get frost in the winter uh, that has decided to move into the day as well to what the Almanacs may be doing in Colombia or Peru. Uh, but it's better than 
what happens in primatology is that if you don't have that, now you take information from Calicebus or some other genus altogether. So I'd like to think that we're better off looking at least at, at a species from the same genus. I'm taking, if you want to have a poster, take, there's some extra posters there of, our, of the owl monkey, they're cute little monkeys, so take one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We went back to Argentina yesterday after interviewing for a PhD in Chicago, but there were all three of us converging in Galapagos in mid-March, so I'm taking them both to Galapagos. And after that, they last, last year, I mean, Matias is 26, Facundo is 24, they decided to apply together to be the manager.